Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, we welcome you to this morning's study. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we have to study once again this morning, and we invite your spirit uh, to be here as we open your word together. I pray that you can guide in how we discuss these things in scripture as we continue to understand um, the unfolding of the lines in this time. And we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can reach deep into our hearts, bringing conviction and power, help us to see our need of you and to depend upon you and upon the merits of thy son, Jesus. And we ask, Lord, that he can be in our midst, that he promised that where two or three are gathered, that he would be here with us. And um, we pray for each other, for this movement, the people in it, and for those that are searching and studying for truth. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. Now, yesterday we had um, did a, we started on a summary of judges. And even though I, you know, I sort of have a plan of what I want to do, I, I know it probably will be derailed to some degree. Now, um, so what is it we think that we need to figure out about judges? What, what do we really have to do to close up this study? To finish the book of Judges? What, what are the loose ends that need to be sorted out? We know that Judges covers a certain period of time. Uh, we know we have a line of the judges and we have these different judges and we have lines for each of these judges. So what is it that we need to do to, to tie up all these loose ends? What are the loose ends that we need to tie up? I know we have some chronology things to sort out. So I'm, I'm asking you guys to help me here. For you personally, what is it that you need sorted out to put judges all together? So everybody's pretty satisfied, or is, is there something that... As, okay, well, as we have been going through this, we've established that there are multiple lines that we're going to have to look at within the book of Judges. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the more difficult thing is going to be to establish what the main line is and then look at all of the subsidiary lines and, and kind of place it so that we can get an idea as to what is, as you've been saying, a zoom in to, to certain portions and what constitutes a zoom out. Okay. Yeah, so as we went through yesterday, we, we, we know that Judges chapter two is giving us this history from uh, 2001 to 2023 with this eye forward to uh, 2030. And, and we have quite well-defined lines. I mean, um, you know, here we have the judge's line uh, drawn there with the Samson and Delilah line below it. But we, we have these way marks, these seven way marks, and then we have the fourth, right? So we don't just have... Um, 
you know, the seven, we have that, that extra way mark. Now in Samson and Delilah, um, we know that this way, and, and that's maybe where we have this sort of weakness or something, because we have Samson as the seventh, and we have Samson and Delilah as a repeat of history. And that is, uh, these first seven way marks give us the history from 9-11 to January 11th, 2023. Now, it, it will point forward to 2030. But Samson and Delilah is going to begin a, a line that's going to bring us to 2030, to the Day of Atonement, right? And, and and ultimately, that line then is going to have the Sunday law at the end, right? So the seven way marks of these lines with the third angel arriving is going to be October 8th, 2030. That's the 10th day of the seventh month, marking symbolically uh, the Sunday law. That is the close of probation on um, the line that Jeff has always drawn out, right? So the third angel arriving is a close close of probation. And so there's some kind of Sunday law or close of probation marked there. Now, again, we're not saying that these are actual dates. I mean, they could be, but we have no idea, right? All we know is that they're structurally part of our lines and that we're pointed forward to them and they do have symbolic uh, application, right? that relates to our message. And so these dates, these spans of time that bring us to some time in the future, we're not going to use them to predict anything. But we know that all of these lines are typical of something that's going to happen in the future. And that thing that is in the future is the Sunday law, right? So that's basically what we learned from Samson, um, Samson and Delilah is that we start on December 25th, 2021. And we're really just dealing with this history since the end of the 777 structure, where we would say that the first seven, like the seven judges, they, they address uh, dates in that structure. We're going to have July 18th. We're going to have November 9th in those lines. But the line of Samson Delilah does not have any of those dates in their lines. It does have the last date, December 25th, 2021, but it doesn't have the other dates, right? So it's just, it's saying that that is a period of darkness, the the 777 period. So we know it's a period of darkness relating to whatever these messages are that are be given, given to us. So, So if you're saying that we need to define these lines, we've gone through these lines fairly carefully. I mean, we're going to go through them again, um, just as a summary to look at how these lines fit together with what we've done as we've, we've gone through each of them. Now we can look at them again and say, yeah, that makes sense. So, I mean, It'd be nice to have these all drawn out nicely in order, and that's what I'm, I'm going to try to do in uh, my notes that I'm going to do for um, the camp meeting. Um, so what are, but what are the loose ends? So, so we have what, what Dwight said is we need to get these all organized, and we do need to go through them again. Um, do we, do we have questions or problems or things that we're not satisfied with um, regarding the lines of, of the judges, right? There's the, some of the chronological issues. I don't think all of us could uh, draw each of these lines individually from memory. We'd have a general understanding of what they're about.
you know, Ron, did you have a thought on that? You know, so Dwight, because I, I knew that your mic had turned on when Dwight started speaking. Are you there now? Yeah, I'm here. Um, well, no, not really. I don't have any questions. There was no, nothing that we really left un, undone. Um, I think we need to go back over the stuff just to, you know, to double check and triple check again, you know, just to make sure that we're, that everything that we've seen is, um, is coherent. Yeah. You know, because I, I can't, no, you're right. I can't memorize this stuff. Not yet. I mean, uh, especially since this new Samson and Delilah line. Um, there was, you know, there was a couple of things on there. I thought it was earlier that, um, but we kind of went over it. You know, it was, it seemed a little brash to be putting dates in there that we, <laughs> we kind of speculated on. Right. And, and we're just saying what should happen. Right. 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 But we, we don't know um, if that means anything. Exactly. We don't know if it means anything. Yeah. Because it's future dates. We can't predict future events, but we can say, well, we're doing this and, and these would be fulfillments of that. Um, so I'm just looking at, you know, I haven't organized these lines in my um, PowerPoint in any way. So I'm just seeing, I know that some of these lines are later. So Judges, Lance Sampson, Delilah. One of the issues that we're going to face yeah. in being able to present what we have seen so far in Judges is to be able to have it be a bit more cogent for those that have not been studying with us because we don't need to repeat the issue that happened with July 18th. Now, I'm not being detrimental regarding July 18th. I believe that this was something that needed to be done because people needed to be awakened to the fact that this is going to happen. Okay, so so the issue, what do you mean by the issue with July 18th? You, we don't want to repeat that. Well, we began studying as a group after July 18th to really understand why we would believe that July 18th was such an important way, Mark. Yeah. Now, we're doing roughly the same thing with this in the book of Judges. Mm -hmm. Yet, this has not yet become as fully ingrained, and I'm speaking for myself, not for the group, but for myself, as, say, October 22nd, 1844, or what we've studied in the past about the, the time of the Millerites. Mm -hmm. Now, as we're dealing with this in the book of Judges, do we have a kind of a grounding or an anchor that can show that what we're looking at with this in the book of Judges is a repeat of where we were in Millerite time frames. Okay. So because we know when we're using these waymarks, we're using Millerite history as the template, right? Correct. And That's the thought. Uh, yeah. So so we should know Millerite history. Right. We should understand the basic line, darkness, the time of the end, the increase of knowledge, the formalization empowerments. And, and so we're using this pattern to analyze uh, the book of Judges and each of the judges, right? Exactly. Now, Which seemed to work out for us fairly well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Now we know that within the movement that the lines had been obscured. And the big one for me was the priests, Levites, and Nethanim to get rid of that thinking. Uh, nothing wrong with the idea that there are priests, Levites, and Nethanim. But to understand these separate lines, um, we now know that that's not how we would create the lines. They, they do sort of overlap because we saw that with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they overlap because there is an overarching line with way marks that we can zoom into to create new lines. So that idea is really what a fractal would be like. Um, the priest Levites, Nethanims, in the way that Parminder presented them, would not be a fractal, right? And, and doesn't represent anything that we see in Millerite history. Yeah, there, there was no way that they even could be a fractal. Yeah, it's just they weren't. And 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 since Millerite history didn't look like that, it didn't make sense to draw our lines out like that. Where when we do the lines this way, we can clearly see not just how Millerite history is connected with our history, but we can see how each line that we have that these, these also exist in Millerite history. That is, we have, you know, a line that addresses Miller, the arrival of the first message. We have a line of Samuel Snow. That's actually Samuel Snow's letters, right? And, and we probably even could uh, draw out those lines in more detail. You know, we, we haven't spent the time as much trying to figure out these different lines, but, you know, each of these way marks, you know, there would be a line of the formalization of the message. There would be a line of the empowerment of the message. And, and, and probably that line of the empowerment of the message, um, you know, would be something that actually connects to our history, right, to 9-11. Um, and, you know, a line of the arrival of the second message, the line that addresses midnight itself and and uh, so when we have the line of the judges we have it drawn out in a particular way and we say that it it represents millerite history it's based upon on millerite history but it's specifically we're making an application to our time that is it gives us details about our movement from 9 11 to 2023 and that's because God's dealings with men are ever the same. And, and we, would, we would expect that God's going to have lines within our movement. And we hadn't understood, you know, we would talk about something being midnight or midnight cry. And, and yet we would have different midnights and different midnight cries. And we didn't know what midnight we were at or what line we were in. So I think... That has to be made clear in some simple way, right? That we can we can show that. And, and I'm not sure if I know how to show it as simply as it needs to be shown. You know, part of the problem when you're dealing with presenting something to someone, like groups of people, especially people you're not interacting with directly, is... You don't know when you've lost them. You don't know when you've left out a piece of information that you assume that they would know. And that piece of information is extremely important for them to move forward, right? So if you're not getting interaction, then it's really hard to know. Um, did you do a good presentation or not? It's much easier to just deal with the person one-on-one -on -one and answer their questions and fill in the, the pieces that, they need but when you're dealing with a larger group of people it's hard to make it cogent i mean you don't know if you've covered all of your bases um, and that they can follow it and and we've spent a lot of time studying it and it's a lot of information so you know in some ways we we could just you know skim over some of this and then just focus upon, you know, the story of Samson, even, right? you know, as an example of, of 
what's done and what's coming. But um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that's that's going to be part of the problem. So, Ron, does that sort of respond to what you said, Dwight? Yes, yeah, somewhat. Um, I just had a, a thought. Um, so when we were first getting involved with Six Sigma in one of my jobs, um, we were given presentations inside of there. And then what we would do at the uh, before we even started the presentation is we'd hand out um, – paper and pencil and ask them as we were going through their presentations to jot down any questions that they had. Mm -hmm. You know, if they didn't, even if they didn't feel like they wanted to express them outright, please write it down. We wanted to, wanted to get your input on this. And uh, then we would take those survey cards and then we would um, see where we were lagging and then uh, incorporate uh, answers to those questions in our next presentation, because we would do these things in groups. Yeah. I mean, it was just, that's just something that came to my mind as you were sitting there talking about it. We were. Yeah. Well, you know, and one of the things I've asked people to do is you have a question and you're watching a YouTube video, you know. Yeah, put, put it on the line. Question. Write the question there. So I've, I've got very few questions, though. You know, so yeah, I've noticed. And you know, and I'd like to have a lot more discussion on the YouTube videos themselves. Uh, just to me, it would it would it would help me a lot. So I mean, Zoom is difficult because you don't get a lot of feedback. I mean, obviously, once in a while, I have you or somebody else, you know, be interacting with me a little bit. Sometimes we get a few people. Um, but that's sometimes, you know, we don't get much interaction at all. And I know where, where my mind is, but I'm always trying to think about what other people are seeing, what it is that they might not notice and try to bring their, draw their attention to these little details. And so it's, it, it seems like a rather slow process, you know, plus also I'm, you know, I'm learning in, as we're going along here. We're, we're discovering things just to me, it almost seems miraculously discovering things. It's not like we have this stuff down or anything. I mean, yeah. we're, we're beginning to learn this stuff now. Yeah. I mean, if we put out some dates there and all of a sudden we find all these numerical connections and symbols that exist in the verses that we're studying, mm -hmm. um, that to me is kind of a miracle. That's God's guidance. Now, part of it is, we're just we're uncovering something that exists. So, you know, we're not creating these things. We're more like uh, maybe archaeologists isn't the best way of looking at it. But, you know, we're digging up something and these artifacts and, and they come to light and we see them and we're amazed at them. Uh, but it's not like we made them. Well, we 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 see them and then we speculate on about them. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, which which can be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm not a speculator, right? You know, I'm not somebody who likes guessing, right? And and I said to Jeff, you know, this was a long, long time ago, you know, that I wasn't good at. Um, uh, I can't remember the word I used, but he's used it a number of times that I'm not good at at um, drawing out the lines or not good at figuring out. Uh, the symbols or, or whatever. Um, um, it's not that I can't do it. It's just that I don't like guessing at something, right? So I'm not going to interpret a symbol um, without lots of good reasons to do so. But, you know, we sometimes have to put things on a line. We have to try things out. It's just amazing how often things work out. Now, I'm sure there's some things that we got wrong. You know, there's some things we just didn't notice something um, that if we did, we might change, you know, one of the way marks to some other gate or something. Um, but it seems like these are fairly solid. Right. 
Now, when we go back to you know the first judges, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, uh, we know that that Shamgar is existing at the time of Ehud. Um, at least that's what it appears, right? But yet, you know, we're going to have these line, this first line here, um, and this is going to be. Um, What's this thing doing here? There we go. There must be something there blocking it. Anyway, um, you know, this is going to be a zoom into a way mark on the judges, which is, is of course, 9 11. And we say that this is 9 11 related to a zoom into the second angel's message. So, 9 11, the, the history of the judges. Um, as we apply it, when we apply it to 9-11, we're not zooming into the, the empowerment of the first angel. We're zooming into the arrival of the second, which is really about the Sunday law. But it's 9-11, which is a way mark in a line that Jeff has created, you know, God, Jeff. But we're going to have this way mark and this way mark... Um, you know, Jeff would go 9-11, midnight, midnight, cry, Sunday law. But really that whole line is a zoom into the Sunday law way mark itself. Right. Where the way that Jeff had understood it is sort of that the Sunday law was a part of his line. But actually, it's just a zoom into that line. It is a part of the line. Um, so when we're when we're taking the history of the judges, we're zooming into 9-11. But 9-11, of course, is going to lead us to the Sunday law. So just as we did with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Joseph. Uh, and to me, that's that's sort of the, the primary model to understand how we can zoom into these lines. It was clear there in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph that we would have this 3-1 combination, that each of them had their own lines, but they're also part of a bigger line. And that, perhaps that's your um, perhaps that's your shoe in the door, per se. Yeah, uh, that, the, the Abraham really Isaac study. Yeah. yeah. So without that, um, we wouldn't have been able to uh, proceed in the way that we did as we went through uh, uh, the book of Joshua, and then finally when we got to Judges, we just wouldn't have been able to. Uh, to see the things that we saw. We wouldn't have had the tools uh, to work on the book of Judges the way that we did. So um, I, I don't mean yeah. to interrupt you, but there was a, um, you were talking about yesterday how we got it. Would you please? Um, how we got into where we started to study in Judges. And as I was going back through the study, um, I noticed that just prior to the end of 24, um, Joshua, that we were um, exploring, uh, I can't remember, uh, well, it was, it was something that Sister White, it was a, a certain chapter, um, and it was discussing the very lines that we were t um, talking about. And from, I haven't really investigated it further, but it looks like it was it was because we were in that study with uh, Mellon that we went where we did in Judges. That that, that that's what I it's looking like. Yeah. After my investigation yesterday. Yeah, and so this is an interesting point you bring up. Now, I'm not sure if I ex totally understand what it was you were seeing at the time, but when you when we were dealing with judges, we were dealing with the covenant, right? And, and yes. just have this covenant renewed here in uh, Joshua chapter 24. And, and this, I'm is sorry, what, this is the covenant renewed in Joshua chapter 24. Right. Right. And, and this is going to go all the way back to Abraham, right? Right. If you read here, and Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. 
and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. Now, why are they at Shechem? Why does he gather them at Shechem? I'm sorry, I don't remember. Okay. Well, where's Shechem? What is Shechem? It, it shows up again and again. Because of Mount Ebal and Gerizim. Right. The Mount of cursing and blessing. Right. So we, we got the blessing, the 2520, right? First right. thing in Leviticus 26, repeated again in Deuteronomy 28, right? That is before Moses dies. He's going to uh, talk about the whole history that they've been through and what they're going to do once they get into the promised land. They're going to go to Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim and they're going to, he, he tells them how to organize and go up there on the mountains and, and, and make this covenant with God, these blessings and curses. This is this confirmation of the covenant, so to speak. Right. And, and then, um, we're going to see this repeated, right? So they're going to do it. And then we're going to see this repeated here at the end. He's going to go to the same place and renew this covenant. And, and so this deals with the 2520, right? The blessings and curses. This is, this is a, you know, in a sense, a repeat of history, right? He's going to go over the history. Isn't that what this movement has been doing? I mean, really from the beginning, yep. you know, and we've been examining the foundation. We go back to the beginning. We see, you know, here's the problem I have with the Adventist church. They have a quarterly um, called uh, Three Cosmic Messages, and they don't address the history of the beginning of the Adventist movement. They don't address um the what's the word the location of these messages right they don't address you know millerite history what is the first message when was it given what are the dates they don't address the second angel's message they don't address samuel snow and the midnight cry right? which are all very important well you can't have a third without a first and second right but if you don't have the location of those messages, if you don't know when they were given, if you don't understand those messages, you can be professing to give the three angels messages, but have no idea what they are. And that's the problem with Adventism. It does not understand its history. Now, are you sure it doesn't understand its history or it's just decided to reject its history? Well, I think there's a bit of both, but I would say that the average Adventist has no idea. I mean, before I came into this movement, I, I'm, a, I'm a Bible student. I'm studying. I'm reading Spirit of Prophecy. Um, but I've ne I had never studied Millerite history because the impression that I always had is that the Millerites were full of error. And, you know, I mean, they happened to get the right date, you know, for the end of the prophetic periods. Well, really just the end of the 2300 days, the 70 weeks, they never even got correct, you know. Um, you know, so I just didn't see uh, the point in, in going back there. But I just didn't know. I mean, I would think ignorance is the biggest thing. The church took steps. And when you get to the fourth generation, they've forgotten the first generation. And even in 1905, Ellen White. Um, is talking about, you know, the pioneers, that that this the, the people that are alive now weren't there. She even says that earlier, right? And we need to have that experience. We need to go back and understand that history. So that's what this movement was founded on. Now, we, we see counterfeits around, you know, people who claiming to go back to the understanding of the pioneers, but they don't understand anything about Millerite history. They get lots of things wrong. 
um, they make all kinds of wild assertions that can easily be, be disproven as incorrect. And then they want to do things like uh, keep Miller's chronology, saying, well, since it was, you know, endorsed by Ellen White, you know, because in Samuel Snow, he's going to keep Miller's chronology when he deals with uh, the 6,000 years and, and the 2520. Um, and so, um, you know, people say, well, we need to keep, you know, Miller's chronology. But Ellen White contradicts Miller's chronology. She contradicts many of the things that are, are in Snow's um, presentation of the, the true midnight cry. Because you know, he was wrong about many things. So, and they'll do this with Uriah Smith. Since Ellen White endorsed something, they can ignore everything that she has said on that topic. Right? Yeah. Because she endorsed much. something that somebody has said. And, and now if she says something different, well, her endorsement of that person's writings uh, override anything else that she says, which is ridiculous, right? So obviously she's not giving a full... It's not well thought out. Yeah, it's not a full-blown endorsement of everything that Samuel Snow says down to the detail, right? She never actually made that claim. I mean, we've I've studied her enough to know that she's... Um, careful with her wording. Yeah, uh, not to offend and not to not to excite. Um, so you have to take it um, as everything that she does say. It, you need to see what she says in order to figure out if that's actually what she's saying. Because a lot of people get things so confused. Um, yeah, they read one thing and it's like, oh well, that's you know. That's that's the uh, mantra now, you know. Yeah. No, you have to take everything. Now, the other thing is looking here at uh, Joshua 24, right? So he's going to go back to Abraham. I took your father, Abraham. Well, this is obviously, you know, God's speaking through Joshua, right? Thus, I took your father, Abraham, from the other side of the flood, that is the Jordan, and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And they gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. And I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt. So he's going to go through this whole history that we had studied as we went through these lines. And so he's laying out a line, is he not? That's what it appears to me. And this line that he's laying out um, is he's laying this out when he's renewing this covenant, right? So this covenant that was made is prophesied um, in a sense by Abraham. I mean, God obviously, uh, you know, is speaking to Abraham. But we, we see this in, in Abraham's life, this covenant being worked out. And it's a prophecy about what's going to happen to the Israelites. And it's going to happen in this chiastic structure, right? The two periods of 215 years over 430 years. And so Joshua is going to reiterate this history. And, and, and he's going to do this in the context of renewing this covenant between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim cursings and the blessings. So, so this is about our movement. We know that our movement, that, that what God wants to do is go into covenant with this movement. Because he's given us all of this light, right? He's, he's brought us through the experience of the Millerites. So in the end, we then are to go into covenant with God. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. And so what the book of Judges is going to be is it's going to be the history of this movement, specifically since 9-11. Uh, 
up to 2023. And so what we know is that God is seeking to be in covenant with this movement. I mean, God wouldn't be giving us all of this light just so a few of us can make some videos and and talk amongst ourselves, right? I mean, He's got a higher purpose. I mean, to me, this this is is a lot bigger than us as individuals. We're just some little Bible study group, right? I mean, there are times, you know, you can have Bible study groups and God can teach you things and it helps you individually, um, you know, because he wants us to be Christians and we need to study the Bible and Bible study groups are good things. But this is something that addresses Adventism, right? This is light that everyone needs to have. So, so this is what God has been doing. Psalm 19, verse 4, Angela. I know you bring that one up once in a while. Yeah, Psalm 19 is for us. I really believe that. Psalm 19, 4, as you guys were talking, came, came to me. It says, their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Beautiful promise, and I know he's going to expand this message as we grow, as we expand. Yeah. Now, now when we look at this, we know this goes back to Adventism. So God gave, you know, this this message to Miller, and, and that message, you know, then to Snow. And then we had, you know, James and Ellen White, and we had this small group of people, basically a small study group that would meet. In a house, Ellen White, I guess they, she says there's about 50 people that basically came out on the right side of the issue after the great disappointment. Not sure at what point, you know, she's marking that 50, 50 souls. But you have a small group of people that come out of, you know, a movement that has millions. Well, maybe not millions, but lots and lots of people, whatever it is, whatever that number is. Thousands, uh, thousands of thousands. Yeah. So 500,000 at one point down to 50,000 and then to 50. Sort of the number that I like because it's nice, simple. But, um, you know, that movement is going to become the Adventist church. But the Adventist church ends up rejecting its foundation. So now you have this, you know, the 1919 Bible conference here. Um, you're at the end of the second generation and it's going to have the books of a new order. It's going to enter into a new organization, something that Ellen White says that we should not do. Now, a lot of people use her quote and saying, you know, you shouldn't start some new church, but it's already been done. Right. The books of a new order and this new organization have already been created. Yes. And the rot has come from within mostly, and people, they need to look through the art of war. I've looked at it, and it's, it's stealth warfare. And how much better to wage war when it's undercover, and it's infiltration, and it's undermining the foundations. Yeah, and then we, we look at Adventism. So, you know, God, you know, led me to Adventism, you know, through studying the Bible, and through hearing about things. I'd kept the Sabbath, and and I understood the state of the dead before I entered an Adventist church. But, you know, and I challenged everything that Adventism had to say. I mean, so I wasn't one of those guys who went to an evangelistic series and had just accepted a bunch of stuff. I studied. When I first got baptized, I spent a lot of time in the public library in Edmonton um, researching, you know, reading encyclopedias and old books and trying to uncover the facts was adventism based on some kind of reality or is, was it just some kind of a cult i wanted to know right red kingdom of the cults first book i read after i got baptized and uh um so so i started to piece together the the history of the adventist church to some degree right there's still a lot lot more that i have to learn but the thing about adventism is it there seemed to be this disconnect from what the spirit of prophecy teaches and what the church is doing. And, and a lot of new converts figure that out, right? 
Some just end up leaving when they find that out because, well, you know, they're not practicing what they preach, so to speak. So why am I in this church? Some just sort of settle down into the social environment of Adventism. Though when you become an Adventist, it's hard to, to actually enter into that, that sort of click of Adventism. You know, somebody who's born into Adventism, a generational Adventist has uh, uh, a different status in the church than somebody who just becomes a convert. You know, the process. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah. Well, I noticed that for the first time when I got married to Heidi because she's, you know, related to half of the people in College Heights. Um, and, and that changed my status right away, um, at least for a time. Uh, yeah, so she's a fourth generation Adventist. So, um, but you know, well connected in that sense. But but the point is, you know, we have these all these different types of Adventists, and you know, and I've been very blessed in that you know the church that I ended up uh, spending most of my time in the last thirty five years has been Warburg Church, which. I don't know if I could have survived um, in these bigger churches in the city. I definitely don't think I could have. Um, I would have been just too marginalized for me to even grow within that church. But Warburg Church provided an environment where I could, you know, as a young man, learn how to do sermons, teach Sabbath school, and learn to work and cooperate with others who are following God. We didn't have a lot of um, unconverted people. You always have some, but Warburg was quite different. It's slowly changing, but um, and to some degree, the church was largely, I, I, my influence was huge in shaping the church to be what it became. So we had a lot of old people. There wasn't many young people at all. And so, you know, we sort of set the tone of what, what we studied and how the church functioned and operated, you know, people have come in that are trying to change it now, but, you know, the point is Adventism is not something I'm very interested in, right? I'm not interested in the organized church. It, I, I really have no place in it. Um, but the truths of Adventism, the spirit of prophecy, I mean, that's powerful stuff. So how do you get, you know, Adventists to actually even look at anything, right? They have all of these walls and barriers built up. And, and so we believe that this movement is raised up to break down those walls and barriers, right? I mean... Amen. It's the calling of Jeremiah where he was told he was going to tear down and then rebuild. Yeah. You know, the thing about it is the stuff that we're, we've been studying, if I could have, if we could have presented this to Adventists 50 years ago, I guarantee you there would be many, many of those people interested and convicted by what we have found in God's word. Obviously, it'd be impossible to do that, right? Um, but you understand what I'm saying, that, that this would be things that, that would be much more readily received in the past than they are in the present. And that's because the church has so far departed from Adventism that it's hard to recognize it as Adventism. It has the shell of Adventism but none of the interior, none of the substance. And, and in some ways I was sheltered from that being in Warburg church. You know, when I would visit other churches, it would be quite surprising to me at how little that people knew about the Bible and how superficial the worship services were and how sentimental, you know, for many Adventists, you know, if they go to church and they get some laughs and they get a few tears, 
they feel that that's a religious experience, right? They need to be entertained and they need to have some story where they can cry a few tears so that they can feel that they somehow are spiritual, correct? That's that's like every church, not right. just Adventist church, but no, every but church. No, Adventism are that way. But it never yeah. used to be that way. You know, it wasn't a church of sentimentalism. It was a church the of... The first Adventist church I ever went into is what attracted me to Adventism. Uh, because people actually um, interacted, mm -hmm. at, you know, like during the during studies and even mm -hmm. the sermons, they interacted. Mm -hmm. And that's that's how I've always seen a church to be, is an interactive church experience, not necessarily, you know, sitting in front of the TV and watching this all stuff happen. Yeah. No, and, and that's why I became an Adventist, you know, went to church and you know, argument broke out. So this is a great church to go to see a Sabbath school where there's a debate and people are still friends, right? So Adventism. Yeah, it was an argument. It wasn't a, it wasn't a knockdown drag out. Yeah, yeah. And a, a, but a good intellectual solid argument that was devoid of emotion. Right, a debate, an intellectual debate. That's to what see it should be. Church, to see that in a church, that was the first time I ever seen it, was in an Adventist church. And that's the reason I got baptized. I was already keeping the Sabbath and, you know, as I said, you know, believed in the state of the dead. But um, if I had seen just what I'd seen in other churches, I probably wouldn't have got baptized. So, you know, I might have maybe attended for a while and, you know, watched what was happening. But we saw right away as soon as we went there the first time where well, we want to get baptized. Don't we call those two things that you just mentioned uh, the two walls that we're always up against is the the um, Sabbath of the state of the dead? The, 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 the understand the Sabbath and the state of the dead. Those to me actually that's that's what's always been the thing that uh, 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 was abrasive to me. It, it you know, um, people's ideas of of when the Sabbath was first of all, yeah. and then people's idea of them going immediately to heaven. Yeah. So they, these attack the two great errors: Sunday sacredness and the immortality of the soul. Yeah, I did, I was fighting. That, I mean, that's that's kind of the first things that just popped in my mind as to um, what I was seeing wrong in the church that I was attending, which was a Baptist church. Yeah. So, so the question that we have, because, you know, we're thinking about, okay, we need to get this message to Adventists, right? Now, we know that we have to go back to the history. So one of the things in my study of this movement, I mean, the thing that I saw that would be, uh, the anchor or, you know, that, that could tie us to um, the past so that Adventists would look at what we're saying would be the start of the 2300 days, right? To, to show that history in the story of Ezra, to show the history of the three decrees, and as well as the story of Joseph, uh, the structural chiasm there. There's there's things that when I show them to Adventists, uh, they can't help but see, right? They're, they they shine out really clear. Now, when it comes to this movement, if we're, we're going to try to translate that into this movement and what we are studying, what is it that we would have to show people in this movement that they would see right away doesn't mean they're going to act on it, but at least they would be convicted that what we're doing is correct, right? So this is the struggle. Like I think about, you know, my conversation with Colin back um, on the 25th of February, right? So I went there on Sabbath afternoon um, and talked to him. And, uh, you know, so I, I try to think, well, what is it that I can show him 
that he'll say, ah, you know, we need to look into that. And, and, and so for people in this movement, there's, there's lots going on. Um, and, you know, and we, we see what, you know, Brother Daniel's doing in, in his study. He's going through good old solid conservative Adventism. Nothing wrong with that. And, and that, that can be our safety to some degree. But we know we have to figure out, um, you know, how do we move on in this movement? Um, because we can't just build up a fortress, right? This movement is meant to act. It's meant to accomplish a task. And what, what does Angela mean? Um, children in the marketplace. What, what, is that, what does that mean? It's just about, um, you know, I piped uh, you, but you did not. Because you guys are talking about the main, the main line, you know, like where Christ said, you're like children in the marketplace. We've piped onto you. You've not danced and so forth. Okay. And then I was thinking of what Paul said, too, about the veil having to be removed from people's hearts. And he was talking about the Jews, of course. But the veil needs to be re uh, removed from all our hearts. And if we're not willing to at least investigate these teachings, we're going to be lost. We're going to keep retrograding and retrograding and build up more resistance to light and we'll be lost. This is what terrifies me. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, right now, Heidi and I are reading Fifth Testimonies. That's my favorite book of the testimonies because it's the biggest one. Um it's not the only reason it's it's written at a good time it just you know after james white has passed away and ellen white's writing there is is really profound in fifth testimonies um but you know she's talking about mm -hmm. how the churches are unconverted that, that the people are unconverted the parents are unconverted the teacher you know like all through the church it's basically I mean, we wouldn't see that if we looked at it from the outside. We would just see a bunch of conservative Adventists. That's what we would perceive, you know, if we went to a church. But really, the corruption that's in those churches are just as bad as the corruption that exists today. It's just, you know, hidden under, you know, hidden more than it is. People are are not ashamed to reveal uh, their sins. Right. They're almost proud of it. Right. That they can stand in rebellion against God. But people used to hide those things much more. But but you think about it. Ellen White was laboring for people as a prophet in the church for years. And that church went into the wilderness. Right. So the struggle that we have, we talk about this veil that's upon the heart. I mean, we know that this has to do with us, right? That the God is giving us this light. And, and that's sort of, I mean, it's a little bit, seems almost irrational to, to suggest that somehow God is giving this light to us at this time in earth's history to, you know, to us particularly, who have no position, no power, no authority, um, you know, how is he going to work out his will through what he has shown us? I mean, that to me is the, is this huge hurdle, but somehow this movement, right, has to be able to, to be converted, right? And that's not talking about like, other people like i mean obviously other people need to be converted but we have to figure this out for ourselves first and then we have to be able to show this light that god has given us to this movement but yet there are these barriers right these barriers of of hurt feelings and personalities and preconceived ideas i mean one of the things i know about people is that people are damaged, right? All of us are damaged. And yep. 
And, and often what we are doing in our interactions with others is because we're hurt, um, we have these perceptions about others and we do things to hurt. So our interactions with others aren't necessarily very, very healthy. Right? So, so we have all of these, is this emotional stuff going on. Um, you know, when somebody says something or does something, it affects us emotionally uh, in a negative sense, right? So we, we, we have attitudes about people's characters and, you know, they say something, it hurt our feelings or, you know, they're this or they're that. And we can judge people based upon that, you know, so we can look at the, you know, the other study groups and we can say, well, you know, I don't like this person. I don't like that person and they don't like me and, and, you know, we can have opinions about them. But the question is, what are we going to do to help them? You know, what are we going to do to, to lift that person higher? And, and that can be a very difficult thing, you know, especially when you don't have relationships with them, right? I mean, a lot of these people I don't really even know. I mean, there's a couple of people I know. But, but even the ones that I sort of know, I don't really know. I've never interacted with them other than in, in meetings or Bible studies, you know, for the most part. And so I don't even know what that person's going through. So all that God has given us is he's given us a message, right? So God hasn't given us a psychological message or some kind of self-help message, He's given us the gospel, right? And anytime we try to, I mean, we need to have sympathy with people. Um, we need to understand how people work. But, but we are told that basically it's the truth that is the light that shines into the darkness. So Christ's character has to be reproduced in his people. His character needs to be seen in us. And and so even though I think about, you know, how I have to organize these studies, I know that there is, there is something that I can't do. I can't make decisions for people. I can pray for them. I can present the truth in, as I understand it, in the, in the simplest and most powerful way. So do you recall the story? of how the chart was developed. You're talking about the 1843 chart? Correct. Okay, what part of the story? I mean, well, the whole story that that uh how these two guys they were working on this stuff and then they wrote they they painted this uh sheet with um figures on it to express that and then Somebody's seen that, and then the next thing you know, they're putting this on paper and giving it to 300 guys. Okay, well, I don't know if that's the story that I know. Who, um, who came up with the story? Who came up with the, the art? Um, it's um, Wasn't it Fitch? Yeah, so they had made another chart um, just a bit earlier. Right. And then they then that first chart is the one that you see with the 2520, the 2300 days and the 1335. Right. Right. So so that chart was made. And then basically they decided to make a, a better chart. Right. So it, the history I know of the chart is in a book called uh, Protestants in Pictures, Religion, Visual Culture and the Age of American Mass Production. So my point was, was, it, was uh, it was a development over time. Yeah, yeah, a very short period of time. Exactly. I mean, so we're we're yeah. gonna have to we're gonna have to put put it out there, however it shows up, and then wait for corrections to come up because there's gonna be people that are gonna go, oh well, you know what I would have done was, you know. You got to have that interaction, all that, all that, that pre-presentation stuff. And so, uh, to get back onto your question, 
Um, so one of the ways that we could show in my mind anyway, I can see this in my mind. I can't, uh, but I might not be able to do this as well as you per se. Mm -hmm. So, um, we get the, you know how we, we keep saying, um, it, this is a zoom into. Yeah. So I, I, I think we should be able to show at least three or four examples of that, of how this line now we can, we can take a line and go from this particular event on this particular line and now come down here and now make seven more things uh, on this particular subject. That's in perfect relationship to that, um, that way mark that that zoom in and we we've got it i mean i've got all those charts that uh that has been pay, posted by uh aaron um you know they're yours they're they're they're, they're dwight's they're yeah so, yeah so the way that i was going to do the 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 paper that i'm working on is i'm first going to address um uh, just the basic over the structure of the lines of Millerite history in our line. And, you know, Jeff's line, whatever you want to call it, Ellen White's line and Jeff's line. And then right. I'll go through. Uh, a call that the main line, right? Or the, yeah. the big line. Yeah, that's Ellen White's line is the big line. Right. And then ours is a zoom into the Sunday law. And, yeah, and, show, and we can and define that like, nomenclature as well. Yeah. So then I'm, I would show that and I would illustrate that with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph. Right. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob being the first, second and third angels message and Joseph being the fourth. Right. Right. And then uh, show that I can zoom into each of them. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and I can have a separate line for Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And that the story of Joseph has he has his own personal line in a sense. But there's also this bigger line. And then we know in the story of Joseph, so maybe this is too complicated, but in the story of Joseph, we can take that and we can connect that to uh, the 2520 for Northern Israel. We can also connect it to the reform line of the decrees. And that connects, of course, to Millerite history and then into our history. So, so even these histories in the past, they're all part of a structure, right? So, right. Trying to do that in the simplest way possible without too much. I keep time. seeing a tree. Yeah, I know. But, you know, I mean, you could have, you know, a tree of all of the lines, you know, where you zoom in and then you can see, you know, you zoom into a way mark and then you see the tree underneath it and you zoom in. Okay, so you're seeing what I'm seeing. Yeah, but I don't know how to do that visually, um, you know, simply. It'd be nice to have sort of, you know how when you have the fractal uh, programs and you can just keep zooming in? Right. Nice if you could just have a, a program like that. It'll show the big line and you zoom in and it just, all these details pop out. You know, you zoom in different places, you just keep seeing the same pattern. But, you know, that would take a lot of technology. But, but the point that we have here, the point that I'm trying to make, and this is just a picture of that chart that was Himes. Joshua V. Himes made this chart. So... So Himes made this chart originally, and then right. the mission to do the, the 1843 chart. But, you know, it's interesting how much these lines are like our lines. Right. Not, I mean, in a sense, you could say we've copied them, but, but they're chronological lines. With these well, haven't we copied them? Because I, I keep looking at this stuff as, as, as the foundational um, understanding. This is the Millerite understanding. And then all we've done is really is zoomed in on this stuff and <laughs> made it more on made more understanding from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And now this book here that this is in, this is this book, Protestants and Pictures. Um, so it goes through the history of lots of different art in America, but it's it's written I've by had that that chart. I've had yeah. that chart so, for years. So he's going to go through in this book. Um, so he's going to go through the Adventist uh, things where they got these pictures from. Um, you know, so that they had. Oh, these he's pictures. quite detailed. Yeah, and this is the book where I it, 
I found that they actually made 500 of the 1850 chart, not just the 1843 chart. I'm sorry. Can I have it? <laughs> yeah, I can send it to you. Could you broadcast that, or can you put I it on an email? It. E email, maybe. I'll, I'll just put it in an email. Right. Yeah. No big. Yeah. How many pages is that? Um, four hundred and thirty-two. Okay. It's a book. You know, yeah. lots of it is is not really relevant to our our charts, but. It's just the development of, of art and as it related to the event. This was basically the PowerPoint of the day. What's that, William? You're going to send me one. Yeah, I'm going to send everybody. One. He's going to broadcast it. Yeah, I'll just send everyone one. Yeah, I'll put it on WhatsApp as well. There you go. Okay. So... So in organizing this information, right, for, for ourselves, um, you know, we know that Judges chapter one, um, it's going to uh, obviously start on one one. So the whole book of Judges, even though this, this part here, Judges one one doesn't have a judge, right? Um, it's still part of that that um, that structure, right? Um, and so we dealt with Judges chapter one, and it's going to sort of reiterate some of Joshua, and then go into the whole things of failing to complete the conquest, right? So uh, the reason why we end up with um, the angel of the Lord coming down to Gilgal, right? But then it's going to deal with the death of Joshua afterwards. So that was kind of confusing, but it's it's just bringing us back to the past. And then it's going to deal with these judges. And when it says the Lord raised up judges, it's going to start in 2016, right? And so we address that. So, I mean, that's one section that I need to address. How come we do this with judges in the first place? But it has to do with this repeat of history. Um, and then, um, so then we deal with all the individual judges. And I don't think that we could go through that, even in these, this study that I'm going to do at the camp meeting. I definitely can't go through all of the detail that we have addressed. Um, I mean, I can, ask a lot. I can have the lines there and people can look at them. But... But they need to, they just need the general idea that we can zoom into these lines. So we got Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. But you know, Ehud has his own line. And and then when we go to you know, um, uh, Shamgar has his own line. Where's Ehud's line? I don't know what happened to Ehud. Um, oh, there he is, right there. So he has a line. Right, you're going to see so Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, each has their own line, and when we started doing this, we we began to recognize uh, these symbols. One of the things that we we've utilized more in the study of Judges than we had in the past was the use of the Hebrew numbers. Right. So, for instance, here here in Shamgar, we're going to this is going to be addressing. Um, uh, um, this these presentations uh, dealing with uh, basically the the time that's going to lead us to October thirteenth, two thousand eighteen, and we probably don't remember this one too much because we we didn't spend a lot of time on it because it's just a few verses, but we could see that the word slew, for instance, which is the Hebrew. 5221 represents December 25th, right, as a symbol. Um, and, and then we're going to put this at Noel in June uh, 22nd, 2014. That's going to be the empowerment of this message that arrives um, on October 5th, 777 days before the, the Mayan calendar date. 
right? So, so these things become, you know, one of the things, one of the problems, here's a problem that we have with what we found. A lot of this stuff is really connected with me. This is a problem we had with FFA because there's these personal prejudices against me, right? So when we had the July 18, 2020 proclamation, as I mentioned, I'm not doing any presentations. Even when I go there on November, you know, for November 9th for that weekend, I mean, they just wanted me to do the superintendent remarks. They had no interest in having me do any presentations about July 18th or about any of the things that we had found. Now, Stephen and Odilio were doing those presentations. But, and it's not anything against Stephen or, or Odilio, because what they were doing was, was good, but there was lots that they were missing because we needed as a movement to understand how these things unfolded. And Odilio and Stephen didn't really know that because they weren't there. They didn't Can know how. Can that be interpreted as the work of the enemies? Well, yeah. You know, how they, how, because for me, um, personality issues um yeah they can they can tend to get in the way but i try to look past those things no matter what because i'm more interested in truth than you know who's presenting it yeah i know and, and i've had that situation where somebody, yeah there's situations where somebody's been presenting and i have personal feelings about that person and and i'm able to set those aside because i recognize them Often people don't recognize their own feelings. And, 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 and I don't know if, you know, I'm not ready to just blame people for that and say, well, you know, they got these problems. They should be able to recognize their own feelings. I think I'm very blessed in that area of being an artist, being a, a poet, a songwriter, and somebody who was raised the way that I was, where my mom helped me as a child, uh, understand what I was feeling and why I was acting a certain way. So I understand a lot about people's emotions and especially my own emotions. I know if I'm feeling something, I'm able to quickly recognize that I'm feeling it. But some people have feelings that are so deep rooted um, that these prejudices have nothing to do with me, right? They have to do with things in their own lives that are unresolved, anger against other people. Um, and only the gospel can change that. Right. And so, you know, a big part of our message is obviously presenting the gospel. But when I look at these lines and I look how intertwined I am with them, that events in my life, presentations that I've done, things that I studied and dug up from the scriptures, you know, through painstaking effort that are now a part of this movement. Um, for some people, they just don't like it. You know, and like there's things that I found out, I remember about the 2520 and Tabo was doing, uh, well, we were doing some presentations on the 2520 at somebody's house. And he wanted to make sure that I presented uh, that the 70 years of Daniel's captivity are connected with the 490 years of, you know, from, from Saul to the captivity of Daniel. And little did he know I was the one who actually dug that up, right? That that was a contribution that I had that wasn't well understood. Nobody had understood the chronology to, to put that together and, and to understand Leviticus 26 in that way. Um, you know, Tabla didn't particularly like me. If And maybe if he had known that I was the one who had dug that up, he might have not been so interested in me presenting that. But, you know, the point is that when you're tied to something, you know, people can feel okay, well, you know, this person is promoting themselves because their idea that they came up with is now being presented. And, 
and you know they must want human praise or something like that right so <clears throat> you know and that's not always the case not everybody is interested in, in the praise of others right but if we're interested in the praise of others we might think that other people are interested in the praise of others correct Correct. Yes. And and so the way that I look at when, I, when I look at it is when I have feelings about a person, I need to take a long, deep look at myself and say, why do I feel that? Why am I attributing a motive to another person when I have no idea what their motives are in what they're saying or what they're doing? And and why am I critical or judgmental? Why do I feel why do they make me feel this way? They don't make me feel that way. I feel that way because there's something in me that feels that way has nothing to do with them. Right. They might, you know, trigger that feeling, but that's not their fault. Right. It's, it's something about my experience that's making me react that way to what they're saying or what they're doing. And so this is a huge barrier that we face because, as I said, we're all damaged, right? People have, have been hurt. And when somebody says something or does something that reminds them of someone else who has hurt them, it's going to affect their relationship with you. It's going to affect their ability to even hear what you're saying. And the worst thing that people can do is often people will claim that they're not hurt when it's pretty obvious that they are hurt, that they're acting out of hurt, out of emotion. You know, so so this is is something that we have to pray about and we have to figure out what we are, what we can do. Like, obviously, we can't change another person's heart. But what can we do to reach people? Um, you know, and this is the thing I struggle with all the time. And anytime I know that somebody doesn't like me or have a conflict with someone, whether it's family members or church members or whatever, I try to figure out what is it that I'm doing that's contributing. But well, some churches. What's that? The church used to have personal testimony time, you know. Yeah, and um, that would reveal some things about a person. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really like personal testimony time, but that's just me personally. Um, I rather talk to people, so I, I like to spend time talking to people as an individual, one on one, and just to kind of hear their stories about their life and so forth. Um, that can help me understand them a little bit. I know inspiration talks about that. Uh, having personal testimonies oh i know i'm not saying that personal testimonies aren't good i'm just saying that uh i think that they are important people should be praising god um i think sometimes though they they can be done in a wrong way so yeah yeah my problem with personal testimonies is simply this it's always the same people who give the testimonies and they always give the same testimonies right yeah, I'm supposed to have different different people all the time. Do it. Yeah. So the ones that should be giving testimonies aren't going to say what's going on in their life or in their hearts or or whatever, right? So that that's my problem. With, but I think they're a good idea, especially in small groups. Uh, in a big church, which I don't know how how functional. Yeah, they are. probably small groups. I would say too. That's why I like small study groups. You know, like twelve, fifteen people. Um, like the upper room studies we used to have. But yeah, so so I still don't know exactly, you know, what we can do. We're going to go through each of these lines again, right? So we're going to go through them and just try to, um, and, and my suggestion is what we should do the next few days is we're going to draw them out. Um, everyone's going to have a pen and a paper or, or something and, and draw out these lines. And we try to do this together. So 
we try to say, okay, what what is the line of Othniel? Um, you know, and, and of course I can help people because I'll have the lines here and we can we can go through them. Um, and uh, you know, Shamgar and Ehud and just deal with each of these these lines and and what the symbols are, so we can go through there and, and understand the symbols. And um, uh, that should help us a little bit to sort through, you know, could we present these more simply? So that would be my suggestion. Uh, how does that sound to people generally? Any opposed? It's good to me. Okay. So that's what we're going to try to do over the next few days. So we're the only issue that I have with this at all with the chart is I've had to oftentimes go back. I see the date, but I have to go back and figure out how we came to that. Right. Um, so one of the things that we should do. So we have these charts and these diagrams. A lot of the dates I know quite well. Right. That's the problem. Because uh, that there was a, a date I chased for a couple of hours um, in researching because it just because it didn't have what it was exactly in there. So we need to kind of be able to thoughtful of that, you know, like how we came to that conclusion, not necessarily how we came to the conclusion, but, but what were the roots of that one? Like uh, one of the ones was a presentation done on February 22nd or second, one of the two. Well, wow. um, and it was on a line and I, I sat there and I stared at it for a long time going, well, what was that? And yeah. I had to go back through all of my, well, actually I went through um, the files you sent me on your presentations and I'd searched out that date and um, finally it came up what it was. And so I, that was, that triggered me now. So I'm just saying that some of the dates need to be some sort of small explanation yeah. to them. Yeah. So what we should do with each of the lines is we should draw them out and also have the explanations written out. And the verses. Yeah, that would be very good. Yeah. Okay. That's the only tr real trouble I see with that. And, and like giving them to people and having them look at it and they're going like, well, what the... <laughs> Yeah, no, I know. So, so maybe what we're going to, this will help me sort of organize my book and doing that. We can go through these dates so we can just, you know, and even where we get them from, how we know this and so forth and, and how they're right, readily accessible to our, you know, okay. to our pointing of our fingers. Okay. So this might take us a little bit of a while to do, but it'd be a good, good plan. Okay. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning and for your help. We pray for people in this movement. Uh, we know, Lord, that we are all hurting individuals, that we live in this world of sin and suffering. We've all had injustices done to us, and we also have guilt for things that we have done in hurting others, things that we wish to avoid in our own lives, uh, things that we don't want to address. But we ask, Lord, that through your spirit, you can work upon our hearts and that the truths that you have showed to us um, will give us the confidence uh, to continue um, moving closer to you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Bring us together again, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.